We'd like to welcome all y'all to class. Uh, I want to introduce Pam to you. She's a very special person to me, I know that. Uh, we've known each other since we were kids. She came all the way from Ohio. Uh, me, I know this is a big sacrifice because she's she has a she teaches at a church up there. She also has a, a large family that and she's down here just with us. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. She wanted to teach up here. Go over all this that she has and uh, I've heard a couple of these classes and I think you're gonna be very happy that you were in here. Uh, Pam, come on up here. Let me pray with you before we get started. This is my sister-in-law, Pam. <laughs> Father, we just want to tell you that we love you so much, and I just thank you for Pam and her heart and uh, her uh, her willingness and her desire to serve you and to teach and to to uh, be the, the woman that she needs to be for you and uh, for all of us and for all the people around her. Thank you for her heart, Father. Thank you for the encouragement that she is to me and so many, and we just pray that uh, you'll be with her. Give her the words that you want her to say. Uh, give her whatever she needs, Father, to glorify you in all that she does. Thank you for Jesus. Through him we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> this is really exciting for me. Do we leave that door open, Paul? You can't if you want to. No, I don't. No, I don't. I just, I just didn't know what you guys did. Um, I'm so glad to be here today. I really am, and I have a loud voice, so everybody clear in the back should be able to hear me. Hi, Katie. I didn't see you come in. Um, but I'm glad to be here. I'm the third daughter of Bill and Margaret Smith, and um, I'm the quiet one. <laughs> and that is true. Um, my richest spiritual memories are rooted in this place. And... Um, Mom and Dad moved here in 1963. I was three, do the math. <laughs> I'm 54 now, and um, when, I, when Pops was a young man of 30, 31, Zach said, stand up, Zach. <laughs> this, this age and this mature. <laughs> My dad would walk across the parking lot. We lived in a red brick house and come to this place. It was much smaller then. But see, he was the tool that God used, along with other great faithful men and women, to build this. See, things aren't birthed this big. I teach, um, I, I direct the dramas at our church, Christmas drama and Easter drama, and the kids get so rowdy, especially the boys. And I tell them, settle down, I know you have energy. I was a kid once too, and they just laugh. I say, I wasn't born 54. It took me a long time to get here. And it took a long time for this to happen process and it's a journey and um, you're privileged people to come here each week and have a big old IV needle plunged in your heart so to speak to get all the truth you get in this place and you're very very privileged because I'm telling you there's voices out there that say don't believe don't believe and you come here and you rub elbows and shoulders and you hug and you talk and you visit with people that say believe. We believe. Amen. And it's awesome to come here. You're uniquely special. Everybody doesn't have this. I hope you know that. I uh, walked these halls from 1963 to 1980. I learned my Bible stories here. I learned the books of the Bible. I met Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here. And Ishmael. And I met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I met the Apostle Paul and Jesus, our Messiah, and his disciples. My whole spiritual foundation was laid here. And before my very tender eyes, I saw this place grow from a little tiny place of how many, Dad? 73 people. 73 to around eight or 900 when I left in 1980. 
Can't say enough good about what I learned here at this place. But in 1980, I fell in love with the Yankee. <laughs> Mom was not very happy. <laughs> Ed says, Ed still tells me your mom still doesn't like me. <laughs> oh, I kissed White's Ferry Road goodbye. And I squared my shoulders and I lifted my head and I walked slap dab into the wilderness. I want you to know that. Right in the middle of the wilderness. One of the most Difficult adjustments I ever faced in my life is when I left my White's Ferry Road. Anybody in here ever left? You know what I'm talking about. I entered the wilderness, spiritually speaking. All of you who have purple little cards, blue, purple, I don't know, periwinkle, whatever they are. I left and I entered the wilderness. What is that like? Read those out. One, huh? Hard. Barren. Barren. Frustrated. Oh, so frustrated. Desolate. Desolate. Hot. Hot. Yes, it was just so arid. What else? Lonely. Oh, lonely. You guys ever been there? What else? Dry. Dry. Did we get them all? Inhospitable. Inhospitable. Okay, man, we're going to start on this road. We're going to say them again, and you're going to say it. And then we're all going to say it. Say it, Amanda. Inhospitable. Inhospitable. Next. Hard. That was hard. Lonely. It was lonely. Desolate. 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 Hot. Hot. Arid. Dusty. Dusty. <laughs> Dry. Dry. Barren. 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 Frustrating. It's frustrating. Is that all of them? That's enough, clearly. Isn't that enough? Because that's where I found myself. That's where I found myself, in the wilderness. And I had to learn to love my husband. I can tell you beyond any shadow of any doubt, he is the greatest man I have ever known. Are we filming? <laughs> I went through a phase in my life that I didn't like him so much. And I had to learn to love him. And we had four kids in five years. I mean, some loving was going on. We had four kids in five years. And then another one came along. And I, and I was homesick. And I was hurting. And I was in a, in, a, in a wilderness. But let me tell you something. Hello, Lamb. I learned, hello, Lamb, everlasting to everlasting. The eternal God, the God of the big picture was with me. That's who was with me. Let me tell you something. He had plans for me. And those plans included the wilderness. Why did I say that wilderness was? Read them again. Inhospitable. Yes. Hard. Yes. Lonely. Lonely. Desolate. Desolate. Uh, Hot. Hot. Dry. Dry and dusty. <laughs> Barren. Barren. Frustrating. Frustrating. God had that plan out for me. I, could, I just couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it when I found myself there. And you guys look so together. I mean, you're, you're just wearing the nicest of styles. And girls, nobody can do the makeup like you southern ladies. And you smell so good. And you're so together. But maybe on the inside, you're dying. Maybe you're hurting and you're lonely and you're in your own wilderness. And nobody knows. And nobody knows, and you're looking and you're searching for a bomb that somehow will soothe something in your soul. And we don't tell anybody, generally. We just walk in this wilderness. And see, I used to feel so bad and ashamed about being in the wilderness until I learned some things. See, I was in that wilderness a good <coughs> 25 years. So I've learned some things. I'm going to share them with you. Let me tell you something. Many things happen in our life. We're just clipping along. I mean, I was clipping along. Fell in love with a man, a good man. Fell in love, took a turn, married him, found myself in the wilderness. What does your say? Many things take us to the wilderness. Let's talk about a few. Zach, say it loud. A rotten marriage. A rotten marriage. Can't that put you in the wilderness? I mean, the courtship is so awesome. He's so charming. 
and, and he's so sweet during the courtship period. <laughs> and he buys you gifts and sends you love notes and takes you out to dinner. <coughs> Certainly he's going to be your knight in shining armor. <coughs> and then you get married. And he, he quits doing that. And he gets grumpy and grouchy. And he comes home from work, sullen and angry, and he kicks the dog and he slams the door. And he's distracted. And he's not noticing you. And he's not helping with the kids. And the dishes are yours and the laundry he won't help with. He leaves his wet towel on the wooden back of the chair. And the only time he's really interested in you is when he wants a quick roll in the hay. Right? <laughs> and, you're, and you're like, what? I didn't sign up for this. And you're in the wilderness. And then him, oh, you're his little sugar thing. You're bringing him no bakes. You know, you're just doting on him and taking care of him and loving him during the courtship period. And, you know, you're just his little sex kitten. Now, it shouldn't be. That shouldn't be before the marriage. But, hey, we know what goes on in this world of passion. I hope that's not the truth, but generally it is. And he's like, she's going to fulfill my every sexual fantasy. Then you get married. What happens then? A couple of kids come along, right? You know, you're the man. You come in. You want a little roll in the hay. She has no sex drive now. Kids are screaming. One's puking. And the man is like, what? where am I? And you feel trapped, right? And you want to get on your Harley and shag the joint as fast as you can. <laughs> And never look back. Isn't that the truth? And you find yourself a child of the king, a daughter of our king Jesus in the wilderness. Who has another card? Life in a financial vice grip. What's a vice grip? Anybody know what a vice grip is? Men? Who wants to share? A pair of pliers. But what's so special about a pair of pliers that would be well, these, when you When you lock them in, they, they hold on, they won't turn. That's them. right. You ever been in a financial vice grip? <clears throat> and you get squeezed and squeezed, and no matter how much overtime you work, the ends aren't meeting, and you're aggravated and you're tired, and you really don't want to work the overtime, but the mortgage is due, and the car broke down, and the other one needs tires, and the... And the, and the insurance is going up, and the kids need tuition and shoes, and they kind of like lunch money now and then, and you're just so trapped. And you don't see an end to this journey, and you're in the wilderness for years. Am I hitting a chord with you? <coughs> What's the next piece of paper? It's yellow, I think. Sickness. Sickness. You're not feeling so, you're not feeling so good. So you make an appointment with the doctor, and the doctor says, let's just do a little blood work. He calls you in and says, you need to come see me. And you go in, he says, the lab work came back. I got bad news for you. You got, fill in the blank. You got cancer. You got lupus. You got thyroid disease. You got sugar. And all of a sudden, you're in a fog. And you're like, oh, Lord, I don't know how to do sickness. I don't know how to do chemo. I don't know how to do this. And you're crying out to the Lord because you're in the wilderness. Why is the wilderness a good place to be? Good place to be. Worst place you'll ever be, but the best place you'll ever be too. Can anybody tell me why? Because in the wilderness is where God and God alone will meet your deepest need. Nobody else can meet that kind of need. I'm telling you, I went through a terrible time in my life. I found myself in my bedroom, on the floor, crying out to God. I was exhausted. I was tired. I was frustrated. I was crying out to God. And I don't cry. But I was this day, and I said, you promised you wouldn't leave me an orphan. God, you promised you wouldn't leave me an orphan. What good does it do you to promise that to me if I feel like an orphan? And there my nose was smashed in the fibers of my carpet, mingled with tears and snot. And let me tell you something. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that left heaven, so to speak, and entered the warm, wet, living, vibrant womb of a young virgin girl, Jesus, our Messiah, brought me comfort. 
just enough comfort to get through the day. That's how God deals with us. In the wilderness, he only gives you just enough comfort to get through the day. Just enough hope to hang on. Just enough courage to face the fight. Just and only just enough. Until he sees we're ready to come out of the wilderness. He's like a football coach or a basketball coach. God sees potential in us, and he develops it in the wilderness. He always used the wilderness to develop his people. I was so ashamed when I was in the wilderness because I did not understand that that's where God led me to mature me, to grow me up, to whack my hind in and show me some things. It's wonderful. Another, another thing that he helps us with is the whole idea of grief. You lose a loved one. All of a sudden, you're alone. And you're like, Lord, I don't know how to do grief. I don't know how to go on in my life without this person. And you go into a tailspin. And you're broken and then you're in a fog. And who can touch you but the powerful hand of the Holy Spirit? to give you that deep comfort that no body of flesh can give you. Sure. Let me tell you guys something. The wilderness is the worst place you'll ever be. It's the best place you'll ever be. So that's where you're going to meet God. Because to know him is to love him. And we don't really know a whole lot about him sometimes. But look, you're still here. And you're hanging on. I want to tell you about my good friend Abraham. Abraham had to learn the same thing. And I want to focus on him just for a minute. <coughs> Abraham was called by God in Genesis 12. I'm sure you guys know this. And I, are you going to be asking, uh, what does this have to do with the feasts? Uh, I mean, has anybody wondered that yet? <laughs> I hate to ask the question, but has anybody, I know you're probably not going to want to answer, but anybody ever watched Breaking Bad? It's like, I, I don't really want to admit to watching that movie. But at, before every episode of Breaking Bad, there was some random scene that didn't make any sense until the end of the movie. That's kind of what we're doing here. Believe me, this is going to tie in. Abraham was 75 years old, and that's an old man when God called him. In Genesis 12, God says, Abram, leave your country. Now, don't let this fly over your head. Those of you who've left your country know this is, this is a big pill to swallow. Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to a land you don't know where. You go to a land I'm going to show you. Just like when you, are, are, you discover you have a disease or you're in grief. You don't know what's around the next bend. God calls us all the time, guys, to go to a land that we do not know. Can we trust him? Let's look at Abraham and see what he taught us. I've left my country. I've left my father's household. I've left the community, and it's hard. That's hard. And I'll show you, he says, you go to the land, I'll show you, and I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and all people on earth will be blessed. Through you, that's you and me, folks. we got to get to know this man. I'm here to tell you leaving is not easy. It's really hard. And God led Abraham straight into the wilderness. It's such a great story. I love <coughs> Nothing touched me so much when I taught like the names of God. I mean, I was doing backflips in my office until then I did the Feasts of Israel. Oh, it was so awesome. And then I got to teach Genesis, and it's great. And that's where we meet Abraham. Such a great man. But let me tell you something. God said, I've got something for you to do, man. And it's going to include the wilderness. And Abraham left it all and followed God. And he met pain and disappointment. This old man got in trouble in Egypt because of famine. And God had to get him out of that pickle. He got in trouble with his nephew Lot. When you have no children, Abraham and Sarah had no children. You just fall in love with your with your nieces and your nephews. Abraham got in trouble with Lot, 
and they had to separate, and that certainly had to break this old man's heart. And at the age of 75 then, God promised Abraham land and descendants. He promised this to a man that owned no land and had no kids. Isn't that amazing? And he's old. And so Abraham finally says, but Lord, I don't have any kids. And he enters into a blood pact covenant. There's a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture. And he's like, whoa, I'm going to have me a boy. And birthdays came and birthdays went. And no son came for ten years. And Sarah, his wife, said, I got an idea. Because see, women, we're fixers, aren't we? I got an idea. And I have to tell you, I admire Sarah. A lot of people give her a hard time, but not me. She waited ten years. That's longer than I'd have waited. And she said, I have an idea, Abraham. Take my slave woman, Hagar, and let her get pregnant by your child, and we'll, write, we'll build a family through Hagar's. That will be our, we'll adopt this kid, and we'll own it. And so Abraham married Hagar. So important we understand. He didn't just jump in the sack with Hagar. He entered into a covenant with her, slept with the slave woman, and had Ishmael, which means God hears. And man, did their family fall apart then. Jealousy, resentment, envy, tension, frustration. And Abraham's like, this will and this journey's driving me crazy. Everything went crazy. And then finally, years, 25 years after God promised Abraham the son of promise, the son that would carry the golden thread of redemption, finally Sarah has Isaac. And you think that didn't cause jealousy now between Ishmael? He's about, Ishmael's about 14, 15 now. And Sarah, you know, back then in this day, they nurse these kids three or four years old. And we have reveal parties now, don't we? That's a new thing. We didn't have reveal parties when I was raising my, pregnant with my kids. Well, back in these days, they had weaning parties. And when the mother would wean the child, they'd all have a celebration. And Ishmael was probably three or four years old. I mean, Isaac was three or four years old. And Ishmael, the son of the slave woman, was picking on the son of the free woman. And Sarah said, I will not tolerate it. That brat kid will never share in the inheritance of my boy. And I'm telling you, Abraham, get rid of her and get rid of him. Wow, Abraham loved Ishmael. This kid's like 17 by the time Isaac was weaned. And he said, get rid of him. I can't get rid of him. He's my heart. God says, you listen to Sarah and you send the son of the slave woman away. Let me tell you something, guys. That tore that man up. Ishmael bawling his eyes out. We know he almost died under a shrub tree. He was so brokenhearted. And Abraham, in faith in the living God, sent that boy away. But it was broken. He was hurting. He was torn up. And he, and, he's, and he just said, I'm confused. I don't understand, Lord. I'm hurting here. I'm frustrated. Have you ever been there? Have you guys ever been there? When you're walking with the Lord and these terrible things happen. What I want to focus on for just a minute is the fact that after Ishmael left and Abraham's heart was broken, he was tired. He had been on this journey for a long time. He leaned against the big old rock, and for the first time in his life, and I don't know why it connected for him now, but the first time in Abraham's life, he called God El O Lamb because he began to understand that this thing that God was doing was much bigger than him. This thing called promise and redemption had a far, much more far-reaching plan than Abraham could even imagine. And he said, God, you're eternal God, everlasting to everlasting, the God of the ages, the ageless God, the God of the big picture. Because let me tell you how we see our life. We see our life like a big old pie, one slice at a time, one heartache at a time. One disappointment at a time. One sorrow at a time. And God says, stop it. I'm the God of the big picture. And if there's heartache and sorrow in your life, it's because I'm working to develop you to fulfill your plan, your destiny in my kingdom. It gives us hope in a 
our struggle. Don't you see? It gives us meaning in our moving. And Abraham glimpsed it, if only just a tiny glimpse, just a slight fragrance. And he called on God, Elohim. Then he, you know, when I discovered this, I was like, are you kidding me? There's purpose in my wilderness. I mean, I couldn't settle down. But I kept missing something in the text, and it kept nagging on me and nagging on me. I, when I have time, I'll look this up. When I have time, I'll look this up. And God wouldn't let me go on it till I finally stopped. Because Abraham did something really <coughs> random when he called on God as Elohim. He went out. And he planted a tamarisk tree. Wow, why would this old man, at this time in his life, why would God of the universe record for us that Abraham planted a tamarisk tree? It seemed too random to me. So I knew it wasn't random. So I looked up the, a tamarisk tree, and it's a slow growing tree, shrubby tree. Doesn't give that nice shade like a like an oak. It gives that speckledy shade, that just enough shade to get you through the day. Why did Abraham plant a tree that he figured he would never get to enjoy the shade? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Why would this man plant a tree after he discovered God was the God of the big picture? A tree he would never probably get to enjoy the shade. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Zach? For his children. Yes! Yes, for his children! Yes, for those who came after him! Look, guys, it was, it was Abraham's way of saying, I believe! I believe! I believe! I don't understand everything! It's not clear to me! I'm confused, but God, I believe your plan is bigger than moi! And I'm going to plant a tamarisk tree for the generations that come after me because you are going to carry them through too. And if we can get to the point in our lives where we understand that God is directing us and shaping us for the, God, for the big picture, then we'll begin to be able to invest in what we will never share in for the glory of the living God. Can you guys give him a hand? I mean, you're just sitting there. It's awesome. That's what I discovered before God led me to the feasts. Because let me tell you something. Abraham was catching this stuff before there was a written law, before there was an Old Testament to knock for him to read in, before there was the prophets or the judges, before there was a temple or a tabernacle. God was revealing himself to this old patriarch. The father of the faithful. I, did, I tell you what, when I can get a hold of this stuff, I just cannot settle down. Because, guys, it's real. And we get to participate in God's plan. And your journey and your heartache and your sorrow along the way has not been wasted. God's using it to develop us into great kingdom workers. Awesome. Now, if we can sink our teeth into that, it changes a lot of things, doesn't it? Okay, now, that being said. <sighs> the name Elo, Elo Lamb is really written all over the feasts. As God will lay out for his people his, redemp his redemptive program through these feasts. That's what's going to blow your mind. I'm going to be teaching some material in this class that I taught to my group down, down in, up in Ohio. And they put up with my oddities. And they put, all, they put up with my rantings and my ravings. And they want me to tell you that they love you. And I really love them. I've been teaching them for 15 years and and, I, and I'm so glad that I can share the next 12 weeks with you. They are going to be, read your red page, your red dealie. They are going, these next 12 weeks are going to be, who has the first one? A walk down memory as we revisit childhood Bible stories. 
Good. What's next? Challenging. They're going to be challenging. Fun. Fun. Thought provoking. They are going to be so thought provoking. <laughs> They're going to be exciting. Powerful. Powerful. Emotional. Emotional. Is that all of them? Okay, let's start with fun. Start. Who's got the first one that says fun? fun. Say it and you guys repeat her. Fun. Fun. Okay, go down your list. Who's got exciting? Oh. <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Who's next? Powerful. Powerful. Emotional. Emotional. Challenging. Challenging. Thought provoking. Thought provoking. A walk down memory. A walk down memory. We revisit our childhood stories. That's cool enough. That's cool enough. Now, we have a little, I have a little dealy thing we're going to do every week. But, and you don't understand now, but you will at the end of, a, at the end of my 13 weeks. At the end of this class, I'm going to say, you guys have your paper here. At the end of each class, I'm going to say, go from this place and shine for your King Jesus. And you're going to say, we will shine for our King Jesus. And I'm going to say, let it begin at home. It will begin at home. You're going to, you are going to love the meaning of like that. You're just going to love it. You are going to be so, I can tell you why. Because I was so touched by what God was showing me. And let me tell you something. The church is doing a great job and I love her. I mean, I know the church has got problems, right? I mean, I know she's tailbone. She's baboon tailbone. Can, do, you guys say, do you guys say butt up here? <laughs> I, you know, I'm not culturally, I'm not sure. I've been gone 35 years. Be patient with me. But the church can be tail, baboon tailbone butt ugly. And you know it's true. Do you guys know it's true? She can be, but let me tell you something. She's cherished. She's fixable. And she's permanent. And you stick around long enough and you'll never be loved more than you're loved by God's people. But let me tell you something. We have a lot of problems out in this world. We come together here and we learn so much. I want you to go home today and ask your kids or your grandkids, tell me what you know about Passover. Listen to what they tell you. See, God wanted us to, to remember these feasts. It's why we do Christmas. It's why we do Easter. But in the Hebrew thinking, to remember wasn't just to recall something, just to recall an event. In the Hebrew, to remember was an intense focus that would allow that memory to shape us and change us and direct us. That's why on the communion tables across this world, what does it say? What's carved in the communion tables? Do this in remembrance of me. Let that memory have an intense focus as you're remembering it, that it changes you, it shapes you, it directs your feet, it directs your hands, it directs your thoughts, it directs your tongue. That's why these feasts are so powerful. And that's why we need to learn the seven feasts of Israel. And the long after that, we're going to do Passover. Say it. Passover. We're going to do unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. We're going to do first fruits. first fruits. And we're going to do Pentecost. These are the spring feasts. Then when we're done with these, I'm going to bring in three more posters. And we're going to do trumpets. trumpets. Also called Rosh Hashanah. Maybe you've heard of that. We're going to do the Day of Atonement. And we're also going to do tabernacles. Blow your mind. Your kids need to know these. The church needs to know these. And then later we're going to bring in two more posters and do the two feasts that were that were celebrated after these feasts, because these were laid out for you in Leviticus 23, we're going to do Purim. Very good. And we're going to do Hanukkah. Because these are your feasts. Look, guys, these are your feasts. And we need to know them. And, we, you know, I was doing this in uh, my class in Ohio, and this girl came in and said, this lady, actually, she said, I was trying to share with my mom the feast, and she said, that's not, her mom said, so offended. That is not true. She said, Mom, it's true. She goes, it is not true. I've been in church my whole life, and I've never heard of the feasts. <laughs> she said, Mom, go read them in Leviticus 23. I will not talk to you about it again, and don't bring them up. Because when we find a treasure, are we offended? 
I'm not. I have a brother-in-law, God bless his soul, he's in heaven now, his name is Richard, and he was a real estate uh, agent, he sold real estate, he sold houses. He sold this house to a man, and everything was closed, the deal was closed, everything was finished, he thought, I'll go down and check on this man and see what he's going to do with his house. And they were sitting there drinking coffee, and he said, I don't know, this old, this old rug here has to be torn out, and he flipped that rug back, and there was nothing as far as you could see, $100 bills, $100 bills. They're like, whoa. Now, you think that man was offended because he found that very true? <laughs> Look, guys, you weren't learning these because we were learning other things. But when God reveals a treasure to us, we just walk out of this place glorifying his name. Isn't that true? Amen. Isn't that true? Amen. And you're going to love, love, love these feasts. Now, I'm going to, I, and I would love to go right smack dab into Passover. But that's going to take a full class. So I'm going to stop now. This is a good stopping point. The introduction's always dull and dry. And for that, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we, got to, we just have to get through the introduction. But I want to say this before we end. Go from this place and shine for your King Jesus. We will shine for our King Jesus. And let it begin at home. It will begin at home. Please bring someone with you next week. God bless you. Thank you.